Hey everyone, my name is Chris Anderson and I'm in Congaree National Park. This park protects the largest tract of old growth bottomland forests in the United States. There's giant trees, alligators, and a whole lot of water. But what even is an ecosystem and how do they work? Let's find out today on Outsider Classroom. <laughs> Uh, there's nothing quite like a float down a river in Congaree. You can relax, slow down, really take in the ecosystem that you're looking at. But what am I looking at? What is an ecosystem? An ecosystem describes an area in which all the living and non-living things interact. There's no set size for an ecosystem, it just depends on what you're studying. It can be small, like underneath a rotting log, or big, like 26,000 acres. The ecosystem in Congaree is a bottomland forest. There's lots of really tall evergreen and deciduous trees that like to grow in the floodplain of the Congaree River. All the living things, the population of every species in the area, we call biotic factors. That includes predators like the red-tailed hawk or the gray fox, trees like the white pine or the tupelo, and the fungi and bacteria that break down all the dead material. Mm. Swamp thing would be a biotic factor. However, sadly he does not exist. Mm. All the non-living things we call abiotic factors. Some important ones in Congaree include the amount of precipitation, the low-lying elevation, and the amount of nutrients in the muddy, silty soil. But how do all these factors interact? Let's ask someone who knows a thing or two about ecosystems. Hi, my name is Kat Coe. I'm a biologist for the National Park Service. I study mercury, one of the abiotic uh, factors that has to do with air and water, uh, which are all abiotic factors in an ecosystem. Um, mercury, it can be emitted into the air and transported thousands of miles and then deposited through things like rain, snow, fog, things like that, um, getting into the land and the water of an ecosystem. Uh, mercury, if it gets to certain high levels can uh, be toxic to animals and uh, wildlife and humans. So for example, if a fish eats a dragonfly larva and a bird eats a fish and a person eats that fish, uh, the mercury can, can build up uh, through those different levels of the food chain and uh, potentially have bad effects on wildlife and human health. So we're trying to study mercury and those uh, different connections between abiotic and biotic factors to see what's going on in our ecosystem. As a scientist, when you study things like that, it's important to consider there's a lot of different influences, you know, all working together and acting together and acting on each other. So Congaree is an old growth bottomland forest, kind of low lying in the southeastern United States, and it has big flooding events, you know, flooding seasonally every year, but also with big hurricane events, things like that. So uh, the wildlife, uh, plants, trees, and different animals here have to adapt kind of as things like weather, uh, rain events change. And so uh, you think about uh, plants and trees that have been living here for years and different generations of animals and wildlife have probably adapted, you know, different ways to deal with the massive amount of rain that it can get at Congaree. 400 years ago, bottomland forests covered 30 million acres across the southeast United States. But only around 40% of that area still supports this unique habitat, and most of those forests aren't connected. That would be like taking an area the size of Pennsylvania and shrinking it down to an area the size of Maryland, if Maryland was scattered into a thousand pieces. So what happened? When European colonization happened, most of those trees were cut down for the logging industry or for agriculture. The timber was valuable and the 
dark, rich soil was great for growing crops. By 1917, most of the big trees were cut down. Used to be that 10 foot diameter sycamores and 200 foot tall white pines were a common sight across the southeast. Not so much anymore. Which brings us to another factor that can impact ecosystems, humans. There's lots of reasons why we've transformed or completely eliminated ecosystems around the world, and to be honest, most of them aren't very good. Which is why it's extremely important we protect ecosystems and wilderness areas that remain intact, not just as a habitat for other species, but for us too. Take Congaree, for example. The bottomland forest provides a habitat for thousands of species, but it also protects our homes and buildings from flood damage by providing a place for water to go during periods of excess rain. This ecosystem also processes and filters organic material, making our drinking water cleaner and safer. Wetlands like this are also really good at sequestering carbon, something we're going to need to do a lot more of in the future. Pretty much all ecosystems do something for humans, which is why we need to not only be protecting them, but restoring them wherever we can. Congaree is a great park to visit. You can hike the boardwalk trail or go for a kayak tour. Heck, most of the park is wilderness, so if you're into roughing it, backpacking can be a great way to explore. Whatever you do, make sure you bring a map and a compass. It's easy to get lost and salt service isn't always an option. Safety first, guys. But you don't have to come to Congaree to learn about ecosystems. There's tons of citizen science programs you can participate in and help collect vital information about the health of ecosystems near you. You can help the EPA track toxic cyanobacteria using the Bloomwatch app. And the NOAA measures and maps precipitation via their online platform. You can also help track populations of plants, animals, and fungi by using the Seek app and taking photos of different species you observe. The best part about citizen science programs is that you don't need any fancy equipment or a ton of college debt to participate. For the most part, you just download an app on your phone and upload your photos and observations. You help scientists understand how ecosystems work and change, which means you, yes, you, can be a scientist too. You get to be a scientist. 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 Everyone's a scientist. Well, that's our show. Thanks for watching. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have some dissolved oxygen levels to measure. We'll see you next time on Outside a Classroom. Want to learn more about our national parks? Then hit that subscribe button, friend. Stay up to date and catch bonus features by following us on Instagram, at Outsider.